I just identified what the context is of the commitments we all had. And until that context is objectified and externalized, you'll be driven by latest and loudest. And, and so it's, essentially that's what GTD does is, is don't be driven by latest and loudest, be driven by the context of all of those commitments and say, I'm gonna take a nap, I'm gonna have a beer, or I'm gonna write my business plan, or I gotta deal with this ugly email right now. And those are then present tense decisions that are made out of trust, not hope. That's David Allen, author of the perennial bestseller, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term, and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to the show, FOMO Sapiens. Excited that you're here, and I want to start this week's episode by going back in time. Picture it. It's 2001, and a young and impressionable pre-FOMO Patrick McGinnis is browsing at a Borders bookstore, which was my favorite thing to do back then. Do you even remember Borders bookstores? They were awesome. Anyway, he picks up a book with a simple yet powerful premise. It's called Getting Things Done, and it sets out a new operating system for life and work. Basically, the whole method rests on this idea. You don't have to keep everything in your head. Rather, your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. I want to repeat that because it's trademarked by the author and it's pretty brilliant. Your mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. So when something comes across your desk and you need to take action, you don't hold on to that obligation. Instead, you move planned tasks and projects out of the mind by recording them externally and then breaking them into actionable work items and getting them done. This allows for your attention to be focused on taking action on tasks and you don't waste precious resources trying to remember what you had to do and why. Now, the simple yet powerful ideas behind getting things done, or GTD for short, were revolutionary at the time. And in fact, I'd argue that David was the first of what has become a wave of productivity experts. The book has sold over 2 million copies in around 30 languages, and interestingly, it has become the subject of highly detailed discussions all over the internet from people who want to offer their own tweaks or impressions of GTD. Now, I actually fell into an internet hole today on this, so if you want to see more, search for GTD on Reddit and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, there's a reason why David is such a guru. So if you don't know him, you're going to like meeting him. But if you do know him, I think it's going to be interesting to see what he has to say about GTD in the modern age. Then stick around for the full moment of the show where I'm going to talk about how I get things done on a daily basis on the little things that don't matter, what I call low stakes decisions. Hint, it involves my watch. So you don't need a watch, but if you have a watch, bring it along for that segment. By the way, speaking of watches, I want to take a little time to ask you for a favor. See what I did there? I want to ask you for two big yet quick favors. If you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, please do it right now. In fact, I'm going to wait a second so you can hit subscribe. All right, there we go. Second, if you haven't yet reviewed the show on your favorite podcast app, please do so right now. And it's okay if you do it while I'm talking, even though our guest today hates multitasking, I'm sure he'd make an exception for this. All right, and now on to the interview. It goes without saying that the world has changed a lot since back in 2001 when David Allen wrote Getting Things Done. So I asked David to come on FOMO Sapiens to talk about GTD in the age of FOMO. But first, I wanted to ask him about his own incredible personal journey. It's unbelievable. In my research, I discovered that his path was far from conventional. Get this. David started on a PhD at Berkeley back in 1968, but ended up using heroin and living on the streets, and eventually his friends had him committed to a mental hospital. Pretty good friends. And when he got out, he worked in some 35 professions before the age of 35, including working as a magician, a waiter, a karate teacher, landscaper, vitamin distributor, glass blowing, lathe operator, travel agent, gas station management, and moped salesman. <laughs> I sense a little FOMO there. And so given all of these things, I asked David to explain how this time in his life 
set the stage for everything that came next. I was not and have never been actually particularly entrepreneurial or aspirational in terms of you know, building some sort of a material world, or whatever. Uh, I was more interested in what's going on that we can't see and how do I access that? So as a philosophy major, then a history major, then a history of thought major, then a whatever. Wait a minute. What are these things we call? Now we call them paradigms. We didn't even use the word back then. But it was all about how does the context we're in affect perception and performance in terms of what we do? I was fascinated by that. I was also fascinated by sort of the freedom of consciousness. You know, and, you know, I, I, I tried to explore academia and then discovered there were a lot of people that seemed to have seemed to be enlightened. And then I wanted my own instead of studying them. <laughs> and I said, mm, I don't think academia is where I'm going to find this right now. So I hopped out. But I still was interested in trying to find out, well, what was the truth about the universe and how do I engage with that appropriately? But I had to make a living. So I wound up, I had friends in my network that were starting businesses, had small businesses, were doing their own thing. So I wound up being a good number two guy. So I just wound up, going, okay, let me go help them do this. And let me help them do this. Of course, I'm just Mr. Lazy. I just walk in and go, God, there's going to be some easier way you got to do this. And so I'd help them fix that. And then I fix it and get bored and then go, okay. And then I go find another gig. They call now they call that consultant. You know, I'm like, wow, well, couldn't, couldn't spell it. It's like, okay. So 1983, 80, 82, 83, I hung out my shingle, Allen Associates. And I said, okay, I think I should probably just sell myself on a project by project basis. So that's what I started with. Okay. So you start as a consultant, but then somehow you end up becoming one of the world's leading productivity experts, not the leading productivity expert. So how do you go from starting a consulting practice to writing this book and dedicating the rest of your career to helping people get things done? I started to uncover because I'd been involved in both meditative and spiritual and, and martial arts practices, how cool it was to have a clear head. You know, that you need that from a practical standpoint, as well as perhaps a mystical standpoint. Uh, and then, so as I started to explore, you know, that process, I discovered techniques that helped me get to back where I needed to be. As my life was getting more complex and professional or whatever, I go, wow, this is kind of screwing up clear space. How do I get clear myself? Had a great couple of mentors and some fabulous stuff that, that, that I learned from people about how do I get my head clear so I can stay focused. And then I grabbed those techniques, made them more objectified and started to use them with my consulting clients. And it turned out those techniques produced the same result, more clarity, more focus, more control, more ability to be, you know, uh, free to focus on the things you need to focus on and to be present with whatever you're doing. So I wound up that, sort of became the core element of my coaching. We didn't call it coaching back then. It was just consulting, you know, with people. And uh, turned out, produced the same results for them. And then some, you know, heavyweight guy in the corporate training world showed up and said, wow, David, we need that in our whole culture. Can you design some sort of a methodology, you know, that we can produce in a training program around this? So I spent a couple of months designing a personal productivity training. You know, and then we did a pilot program for a thousand of their executives and managers you know, and, and whatever and and supervisors over a year's period of time. And it was highly successful. They'd never experienced anything like this. I went, wow. So I suddenly found myself thrust into the corporate training world with something I just uncovered. Now, Patrick, come on. I have to admit, never had any formal traditional training in business, psychology, time management, any of that. This is all street stuff. Yeah, the world taught you the lesson, and and it, it. We were talking before, in the in the sort of before the interview about a concept that um, by Carl Jung called the wounded healer, which I truly love, which is this idea that you know many people choose a profession of it, the profession of psychology because they are one step ahead of the patient on their journey, and in the world of FOMO, I'm definitely one step ahead of the patient on the journey, and you 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 know you 
came up with these methodologies for things that you needed to do. And in fact, Wired Magazine says that you specialize in curing the psychic pain caused by the pressure of time. I really like that. It's a lot in that. Curing the psychic pain caused by the pressure of time. So what does the getting things done methodology do to help overcome that psychic pain? (laughs) That's a big question, Patrick. I know. Well, we have plenty of time (laughs) today. Yeah. Well, if you were in a crisis right now, your building catches on fire right now. You have no issue in terms of your decisions about what to do. The problem is if you're not in that kind of crisis, you have the kind of subliminal bigger crisis, all the demons at the gate come rushing through. Oh my God, Patrick, you could do this. Oh my God, you could do this and you could do this. You could do this. So, you know, you pretty much identified the issue of, of, um, you know, the spoiledness of too many options, right? So you have too many options to do in that sense. What getting things done and the methodology I came up with is is defining what all those options are and then looking at the levels of commitment you have at the multiple horizons that you are engaged with. Why are you on the planet? You know, what, what's your idea of wild success five years from now? What do you need to do in order to get there? You know, what are the things you need to maintain and manage like your finances and your dog and your and your and your partner and your, and your, you know and your health, and all that. And what are all the projects you've got about all those open loops about any of that? And then what are all the things you need to do about all those open loops and projects? What are the actions you need to take, the things you need to buy at the hardware store, the stuff you need to talk to your life partner about, the things you need to, yada, yada, yada. I just identified what the context is of the commitments we all have. And until that context is objectified and externalized you'll be driven by latest and loudest and and so essentially that's what gtd does is is don't be driven by latest and loudest be driven by the context of all of those commitments and say i'm going to take a nap i'm going to have a beer or i'm going to write my business plan or i got to deal with this ugly email right now and those are then present tense decisions that are made out of trust not hope So is this hard to learn? Is this the kind of thing where you have to spend, I don't know, hours reading and and implementing, or is it something that you can do quickly? You can learn it in 20 seconds. What's got your, what's got your attention? Why? What do you need to do about it? Right. And where do if you can't finish that right now, where do you park or reminder that and trust you have some sort of a system to remind you about it at the right time? Okay, I, I yeah, I stand corrected. So what I what I think is powerful about this is that when you park those things on the side, you leave the room to be creative. Uh, as a writer, I've had to learn to do. I'm sure you you did the same. Is when you're writing a book, you you can't simply be distracted all day long. You can't be checking your apps. You can't be checking your phones. You have to park things on the side to make the room to have the creative thoughts. And so in a way, what I think about when I think about this is this is a system to get the essential things done. That way you have the brain space to do the things that you really want to do. Is that a, is that a fair representation? Of, yeah. yeah. You don't need time. You need room. It doesn't take any room. You don't need time to have a good idea. You don't need time to be present with your kids tucking them into bed. You don't need time to be innovative or creative. You need room. Now, this book, when it came out in 2001, I read it and I still apply lessons to it from it today and the way that I do things. And I'd never seen a book like that before. That was a long time ago. The world has changed dramatically. We had no iPhones. We had no social media. The internet, I don't think we had Wi-Fi, if I'm thinking correctly. And so as you think about the changes that we've seen in the way that we live our lives and the level of connectivity that we have what, how has that sort of changed the way you think about the system and the way that people use it and just the challenge of, of getting things done in, in our lives today? Nothing. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. When I was 14, I hung out with on two hours on the telephone with my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Social media. What's the difference? There's no difference except volume, content, speed. Those are the only things that are different. 
how you manage that is no different from when it was. Should I spent two hours on the telephone with my girlfriend at age 14? You know, I don't know, depend on what else, whatever else I was doing. So it, it comes down to the same questions, the same issues, the same decisions you need to make. So why are you hanging out on Facebook? Why are you hanging out on, on LinkedIn? Why are you hanging out on Instagram? Is that fun? Is it cool? Is it is it adding to your life or not? So those things, the 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 objective stuff we deal with does not define your life. Your life defines how you engage with those. I think the 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 change for me though, as I think about this, the fundamental you're right. I, I remember I spent hours on the phone growing up. The 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 fundamental change is as a you know the velocity. So just the number of data points that come in in an email every day. How many, you know, how many emails do you get a day? I got I meant probably hundreds, right? How many text messages, WhatsApp messages? So just the frequency of of, of sort of pings on your brain. Um, yeah. And dealing with those requires, you know, you need to be extremely adept to, to, to make through the day. Yeah, that's what's different. It's the volume and speed and content, you know, and, and absolutely. So that's changed a lot. But it hasn't changed my methodology. You just have to go, <sighs> okay, given all this stuff coming in through those, through those different channels, what do they mean to me? You know, do I have anything what showed up on an Instagram that I need to do or want to do? So you, have, you still have to go through the process of, call, okay, these inputs that I'm allowing into my life, what are they? And then do I have some action or some commitment or some inclination that I want to do about any of those? So that's nothing new. That's, that's been true since, you know, since dirt, you know, and it will be true in 2090 when we fly to Jupiter, they still didn't invest it. They still need to decide, wait a minute, we just got some input here. We need to put that somewhere and we need to decide what to do about that. And then where does that go so that, that we manage that appropriately? I just identified that process. You know, don't choose the messenger. I just identified what the process was about how you get things clear, how you get things under control and things focused that don't, that doesn't happen by itself. You actually have to apply a thought process and a systematic process in terms of, you know, your own or some, you know, cultural system that you, that you park the, the results appropriately. Now, do you find that there are, you know, on the flip side, with all the new technology that we have, for example, I was reading that the first iPhone didn't even have a to-do list on it. And now, of course, there are a million apps that you can download, and it's built into the phone itself. As we think about all these, these technologies and the apps and all these system, systematic ways of managing our, our lives, do you think that we're in a better position because we can use those to actually implement your process? If you know what you're doing, it's a great time to be alive. If you don't, you're toast. And so as people go through their days, I mean, I, one of the things that I see a lot of in my work and, and talking to people is that the, the, the fear of something better coming along, right, FOBO, the idea that, well, if I deal with this now, I, 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 I answer this email, I buy this product, I do this thing because I want to get it out of the way so I can make space for the things that matter to me. If I do this now, something better might come along. I might not sure. get the optimal outcome, and that's a lot of fear in that. How how do you how do you deal with that in, in, in moving past things? Relax, make no decision about anything, and only when the pressure shows up that you then have to make a decision. Make a decision. Now, lay back up a little bit and say, okay, so what are the potential options you have? By the way, where are you going? Why are you on the planet? What do you want to what do you want to have in terms of lifestyle and career in terms of five years from now? While success, what would that look like? Do you have that vision? And by the way, what are the things you need to do within the next 12 to 24 months? What do you need to have true or finished so you get that vision in place? And oh, by the way, how are your finances and how's your dog and how's your 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 partnership and how's your health 
And oh, by the way, what are all the projects you have on all that? And by the way, what are all the things you did, need to do about all those open loops that you've created or implicitly allowed into your life? So most people have 30 to 800 to, to 80 projects, get tires on my car, uh, figure out what to do with my kids for the next, you know, their next session, uh, get a home office set up appropriately. And most people have 180 to 200 next actions. I need to get these things at the hardware store. I need to talk to my partner about this. So if you say, how do people handle all that? I go handle all that, but all that has a lot of inventory that most people have been pretty much clueless about identifying and getting objectified and putting it in some external brain they can review and, and, and work with. You work with a lot of high capacity people, leaders who, uh, in your coaching work, who have really crazy lives, busy lives just trying to process information, but also trying to deal with their normal lives, the things that they're doing outside of work. So when you work with a new client, somebody like that, what, what are the first fundamental changes that you work with them to achieve in order to, to, to successfully navigate such a complex world? Up to them. I just have to identify the options. Most people have no clue what their options are. And how do they, how do they, how do you identify them? Uh, what's got your attention? Oh, I need to handle my grandparents. I need to deal with this. I need my, whatever. I've got tires in my car. My kids are at the college. Uh, oh my God. I hire a vice president, uh, uh, restructure the company because we, we just capture all of that first. What's got your attention? And then we go through the process of clarifying. Well, what is that? What's the outcome you're you're, you're you know you're invested in creating? And what's the next step you need to take? And then identifying those, and then making sure the client has the appropriate system to to manage the re, um, reminders of what they need to buy at the hardware store, what they need to do at the next board meeting what they need to do, whatever. We just get people clear about the their work. And most people are so unclear about their work. I mean, Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker, would say, as a knowledge worker, your, your, your biggest issue is defining what your work is. He didn't tell you how to do that. I did. As I listened to you today, I, I used to sort of think of this whole thing as a very tactical way of, of managing your time and your life and your productivity. But the more that I hear you, it feels pretty philosophical. This is sort of about, you know, what, what am I doing right now? Why is it important to me? What are my priorities? Well, it, it's, I, I'm sorry. Philosophical. Why do you mean philosophical? That's why I left philosophy. <laughs> it was so, it was so stupid because they just, they just, you know, you know uh, affirmed, their original hypothesis using their original hypothesis. I'm saying, I'm sorry, this is reality. You say, what do I need to do about this? What's the reality of that? That's not philosophy. That's a, that that's a best practice thinking process and organizational process to be able to manage whatever you're doing. I don't care how, I don't care what your philosophy is. What's got your attention? Why? Right. And okay. What would, what would finality or closure or uh, on that look like? Great. What's your project? Great. What's your next step? Is that call your attorney? Is that, is that, is that have a conversation with your life partner? Is that surf the web about X, Y, Z, whatever. So this is highly practical. But it takes all that weird you know, sort of out of, out of out of what can I do about this context and puts it down to reality. Uh, now, David, since you came out with the book twenty years ago, millions of people have read it. I mean, there, there's a whole there's a whole section of the internet 
that's about discussing this methodology. And it also spawned an entire industry of, you know, productivity and life hacking. And there's, there's, it's a, it's a massive um, economy around that. And I'm curious, as you look at that world and that industry, do, are we more productive now than we were 20 years ago? Patrick, what do you mean? Are, uh, what's a productive day for you, Patrick? For me, a productive day is moving through the things that I don't want to do quickly and efficiently so that I have the space to do the things that are important to me. I have the, the, not only the space, but the space to be creative and free from worry about things that, that, that are obligations. So what's not universal about that? I think that's very universal, but I think a lot of us, we end up, and this is exactly what your methodology is about, we end up doing a lot of things that feel like we're getting things done, but are actually just busy work. Better than taking drugs. <laughs> <laughs> True. So as long as you're doing something productive, you know, as I say, at any point in time, just look at all your options. And then just trust your gut or your heart or your liver or your spirit or whatever you want to trust or what you're doing at any point in time. Once you're there, that's no different than it was 40 years ago, no different than it will be 40 years from now. All right. If you want to check out David's work, just head to gettingthingsdone.com. David Allen, thanks a lot for stopping by. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for the invitation. Great interview. Lots of fun. FOMO. And now it's time for the foam moment of the show. And today I want to talk about my favorite way of getting things done when the stakes are low. And it's called ask the watch or ask, you know, whatever you want to use for your inanimate object. But let me explain. So one of the things that I realized when I was in college was that I spent a lot of time on what I now call low stakes decisions. These are things that I would not remember having decided in a couple of days or maybe even a couple of hours. For example, should I go on a run? Should I go to the, the cafeteria first or should I go to the library first? I mean, these were the kinds of things that ate up precious time when I was in college, when I was a sophomore. I remember it so well sitting there, talking to friends of mine, and just feeling completely confused about these little things in life that didn't really matter. And then one day, my friend Francesca, who was dating a guy down the hall, came over and said, Patrick, why don't you just ask the watch? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're trying to decide between one thing and another, and they don't matter. So the problem here is that you are bringing a lot of energy and drama into this decision. But if you took yourself out of the decision, you could move on. And frankly, it doesn't really matter what you choose. You just have to choose. So why don't you do this? Look down at your watch. One of the decision options is the left side. The other is the right side. Look down, see where the second hand is, and your watch will make the decision for you. And so I remember that day I was deciding whether I should go to the library first or if I should go to the cafeteria first. I looked out on my watch. Left side was library. Right was cafeteria. It was on the left side. I went to the library. Got an A in that class. So clearly the watch knew what I should do. And I've been doing that now for years. Whenever I get stuck on something that doesn't really matter, where there's not money involved, where this is something I won't remember in a couple of days, where if I make the wrong decision, it's not going to affect my life. I ask the watch. I do it all the time. And guess what? The watch always gets it right. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I have never, ever, ever gone against the watch, not once in those entire 20 years. Part of the reason is because I don't ask the watch things that I really think I know the answer to. This is when I'm completely indifferent. The second is that, frankly, I don't want to go against the watch. I don't want to break it. I'm very superstitious. And if I break this pattern, maybe the watch will be mad at me and it won't work anymore. Now, obviously, that's a little crazy. I hope you don't think that way. But one thing is very important to keep in mind. Maybe you don't wear a watch. What can you do? Well, you carry a cell phone most likely, so you can do even and odd on the time. You can do this in so many different ways. But the reason why I like the watch is that you can break it up into halves or quarters or any sort of increments that you want to break it into. So you have the opportunity to deal with more than a either or. You could have multiple options to choose from. No matter what you do, remember, when you are taking yourself out of the decision, you are the one who is causing the problem here. So when you take yourself out, you can move forward, make your decision, get on with your day, and then actually deal with the things that are important to you. Now, I actually made a TED Talk about how to make faster decisions that it talks about this and other strategies of decision-making. So if you haven't seen it, head over to TED. 
It uh, is called How to Make Faster Decisions, and it's been viewed something like 700,000 times, and I think across all social, over a million times. So I'm really excited people are watching it. And what's been cool is people have been sharing their own ways of making decisions with me. And I imagine you have your own ways of making decisions, big and small. So if you want to share those with me, drop me a note at Let's Connect at PatrickMcGinnis.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram and tell me what works for you. I will share the best stories and ideas on a future episode of the show. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMOSapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.